Welcome to our session, Gender Inequalities, Is That a Roadblock to Sustainable Societies? So this is part of our workshop this week of the cross-cultural program, Knowledge to Act. I'd like to give a special welcome to our INSEE colleagues, who I think are able to watch us now. And we will, without further ado, dive into our thematic of the day. So our thematic of the day largely is gender empowerment. But we thought it'd be very relevant in 2020, especially this year with everything that happened to link it to sustainable societies. Sustainability has been a topic, a buzzword going on for decades now and mostly associated to the green development, to the environmental sustainability, which evidently by all means in this global interdependent world in which we are is more than ever urgent. But today we're interested in understanding what are the rules of inequalities when it comes to sustainable development? What is the broad definition of sustainable societies? How do we get to societies that are harmonious where everybody has their place to build together a, 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 a world in which it's all comfortable, fair and just for us to evolve? So more specifically today, our topics to look at gender inequality and what's that role in all of this. So we'll be looking at different concepts around the topic of gender inequalities and start discussing how can we challenge our what's maybe taken for granted and how can we build on what's actually already being done. So to, to join this discussion today, we'll be joined by two wonderful ladies. This is an all female panel today to talk about this. And our first uh, speaker, Dana Giroux, comes from the Berlin Women's Peace Organization, OWEN, and has been working on a transnational platform. Um, so Dana, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I will share a small presentation so that I hope hopefully it's easier to follow my um, my speech. Um, the title of my input is uh, "What does feminism actually mean?" And actually, I don't have a ready answer, and there are probably very many answers, and all of you might have something to say about this and have your own answers. Uh, but I want to try to share some experiences of the organization I'm working from in order to approach on what does feminism mean or to give a subjective um, idea of this is. And so I will tell you uh, something about the story of the East-West European Women's Network. That's how my organization was named before during the first years. And this is at the same time, a story about the German reunification 30 years ago. So, and it's about the end of state socialism in Eastern Europe. Um, this conference is called Knowledge to Act, Challenging Inequalities. And I think this is already the first issue. Feminism is about challenging inequalities. And so my first hypothesis would be uh, that feminism is about challenging power relations. Um, the starting point of the story I will tell you is March 1990, when first free elections were taking place in the GDR. This is the German Democratic Republic, so Eastern Germany. My colleague Marina Grasse, named Marina Bayer by this time, was asked to become the gender equality officer in the newly elected GDR government, and she did. During the following month, the so-called German reunification was proceeded at an incredible pace. This process led to the accession of the GDR to the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germany, in October 1990. Accession means that from October 3rd, the Western German constitution and legal system became valid throughout the Federal Republic and the former GDR. Why is this event important from a feminist perspective and how did it lead to the birth of the East-West European Women's Network? The living conditions of women in the former two German states were different um, and also different were the themes, practices and discourses of the women's movements in East and West. 
while mothers in the GDR or in Eastern Germany naturally went to work, working mothers in Western Germany struggled with the image of the uncaring mother. Accordingly, there were well-developed childcare structures in the GDR, whereas this was only very limitedly the case in the FRG. Regardless of the fact that in both states, the equality between men and women before the law was guaranteed by the constitution, the real situation differed quite a lot. In West Germany, the structural barriers to women's participation in societal life went hand in hand with the women's picture showing kitchen and children as the destiny of women. In Eastern Germany, there were other role models and opportunities for women. But even in Eastern Germany, women had no equal access to power, uh, positions of power and were underrepresented within the political system. The same in the private sphere, women were not really equal to men. They did most of the reproductive work. The opportunity for women to study and work was not made possible by a redistribution of domestic work between men and women, but by the state taking over reproductive work. So in the case of GDR, one could uh, speak about state feminism. And so the women's movement and the perceived need for engagement for women's rights was rather weak. The situation in West Germany was uh, different. There was a very conservative culture after the Second World War with an idealization of the family as the core of society and with a working breadwinner and an all-time caring mother. In the late 60s, a strong women's movement erased, fighting against the discriminatory situation of women in the FRG in all spheres of society. Women in the FRG were largely excluded um, culturally and structurally from the public sphere. Under the motto, the private is political, they were not only fighting for changes within the political sphere, but were also ch challenging power relations within families and inside marriages. Coming back to the experiences my colleague Marina made while being the gender equality officer in the GDR government during the reunification process. Imagine the following situation. The GDR was about to join the FRG. Negotiations were made to discuss the concrete conditions. The situation of women in the FRG was much worse than in the GDR. Power structures in both states were still dominated by men. There was literally no women's movement in the streets of the GDR. Marina and her two fellow employees stood relatively alone in the fight for a gender sensitive reunification, which could have taken into account achievements in women's policy. Only very few things were taken into account. And the following transformation process from state socialism to a market economy was not proceeding in the favor of women. Women from the GDR were much more affected by the radical changes during the following years than men. In view of this very important and drastic experiences, Marina and her colleagues founded the East-West European Women's Network, a short called OVEN, in 1992. One of the aims was to get into touch and to find coalitions with women's movements in the West, first of all in Western Germany, and the other aim was to support women in other post-socialist countries. It had to become evident that strong networks and solidarity was very much needed in order to shape the ongoing transformation processes in a gender equitable way without women as losers in this history. So coming back to my first hypothesis, feminism is about challenging power relations. The example of the German reunification process shows that patriarchal structures are very resistant and durable. In order to change the situation of women and men within society, power relations have to be challenged over and over. A real and very deep de democratization process is necessary. Power relations must be challenged at all levels from the level of political representation to the working condition in the labor market to the so-called private level within families and love relations. Coming to my second hypothesis, feminism is about solidarity. So theoretically, the idea was very clever. 
Eastern German and Eastern European women should build a network with women from Western Europe and Western Germany. And with their great knowledge and capacities, they would change the world around them. The transformation period was difficult, but it contained the potential for profound changes. But in fact, this was not so easy to do. Hegemonic power relations are very persistent in our society, leading to all kinds of hierarchies. This prevents a real questioning of the balance of power. So directly jumping into the third hypothesis, feminism is about recognition of different perspectives. The founders of the East-West European Women's Network tried to engage in dialogues with women from the West. It occurred very quickly that even within Germany, they had no common language. Notions that were very important to Western German feminists sounded strange in, strange in the ears of their colleagues in the East. Because these words have been part of the state rhetoric for these women, these were just empty words from the mouth of the former political elites. Additionally to that, people from the former socialist countries were seen as the losers in the history. They were largely not seen as political actors, but as victims and thus objects that needed to be instructed. And at the same time, Western feminist scholars were fascinated by the socialist state who did so much for women's rights. And the, these Western um, scholars had the position and resources, for example, within universities to study and to write about women in socialist countries. Many women from the former socialist countries read these analyses and did not recognize themselves in it. This was not about them, not about their experiences. So together with colleagues from the Czech Republic and other Eastern European countries, the women from the East-West European Women's Network started a big project under the name Women's Memories, researching the lives and identities of women in socialism. Together, they recorded more than 400 interviews with women from different generations who lived in socialist states. To all women involved, it was very important to explore their own histories and to provide the world with a more differentiated picture of the past. On the basis of these experiences, the OVEN team also developed methods to enter into dialogue about the different perceptions of the past and the present. The conviction was and is that real changes can only occur when different perspectives are heard and joint analysis are made. Coming to my last hypothesis, feminism is about collective action. So the vision of my colleagues developed and uh, that we developed and that we are still pursuing today is about collective action. We work with women and men who seek to change their way of life and their local living environment. We encourage to build up collective organizations and structures, formulate common goals and organize public activities. Uh, before ending my presentation, I want to share one instrument with you that we are using very much in our work. It is an analytical tool or an analytical model that helps us to build up holistic strategies and it's best um, expressed within a triangle. So it's the so-called gender triangle where we can see the different dimension of gender. Um, it shows the interconnection of these different dimensions. On the one hand, you have the um, individual, individual level, it's the individual gender identity. How do I define myself as a woman or a man or somebody else in the society I live in? Um, the question of gender symbolism is the other dimension of how is gender inscribed in our cultures? What are the cultural images of what female or male behavior might be? And uh, the third dimension would be uh, the structural dimension, the gender structure. So this is, this is about institutions, structures, laws, uh, the access to resources and uh, these kind of things. And following these schemes, OVEN operates on the three levels, the personal, the structural, political, and the cultural level. Doing all this, the most important conviction that we have in our work is that real changes can only be achieved by collective action.
So I'm very glad to be here at this conference and to look in your faces because I think that uh, together we all can make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you for this very thorough look into the definition of, of feminism from this East-West perspective. Before we enter a, a discussion, I'd love to, to hear from our other um, speaker, Denise Hirao, who is a lawyer by training and who engaged in multiple capacities on the topic of, of gender from Brazil to Berlin and New York. So we would love to hear uh, your very global input now, Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you, Dana, for this very interesting presentation. I think the topics that you pick, uh, challenging re power relations, solidarity, rec recognition of different perspectives and collective action, I hope to come back to them in my presentation as well. I totally agree with them. Uh, I also would like to thank Aoife for this invitation. As I said, when I accepted it, I really think that this type of program, such as the cross-cultural program, is extremely important at this moment, because in a world that is globalized, the opportunities for progress are also global, and so are the threats. So a global civil society is extremely important at, a, at the moment that we live. And I think this type of program brings, brings people together, create, uh, create connections that were not there and are going to be very important throughout each one of you, of yours lives, your lives, and uh, for this collective action that Dana mentioned as well. Well, uh, my topic today is, gen is women's rights and gender equality in different cultural contexts reflections from Latin America. I'm going to start talking briefly about gender, then um, give you an a brief overview of where we are in Latin America on women's rights and gender equality, and give one or two examples, depending on the time, of how gender inequalities have been an obstacle for uh, achieving a sustainable society, which is the name of our session today. But well, so first of all, gender is about all of us. It's not about women. It's not only about LGBTQI people. It's about anyone. So it's about women, women's rights, and the gender inequalities, this power imbalance that Dana talked about has uh, is the origin of lower salaries for women, of violence against women, domestic violence. It's the origin of, uh, it's at the root, a root cause of so high rates of maternal mortality remaining in so many countries, despite the fact of that most cases could be avoided. This is not a political priority, and this is about gender inequality. It's also about LGBTQI people, it's about gender identity, it's about sexual orientation and all the intolerance to, towards who, those who do not conform to the um, stereotypes, the, the patterns that are established for each gender. So all the violence against them and all the uh, lack of rights to live a um, normal life. But it's also about models of masculinities that are behind the high number of young men killed in, in gang war, in the drug war in our Latin American countries. And it's also about the models of masculinity behind resp responsible parenthood about, that provides the opportunity for some fathers at the moment to have the joy of being responsible, of taking care of their kids closely, which they did not used to, which parents, fathers in general, did not used to do generations ago. So it's also about models of masculinity that have been changing. So gender is about all of us. Of course, uh, we, we have a particular concern about those who in this power imbalance are uh, less powerful. And uh, my focus today is on women's rights. 
So as most of you are not from the region, I would like to give you an overview. Latin America is an extremely, extremely unequal society, it has extremely unequal countries economically. You have very, very rich people, um, a small number of very rich people and a large number of poor people who are also, who also belong to groups that have been historically marginalized. In Brazil, black people, in many of the other Latin American countries mostly, indigenous peoples, not, not that in Brazil they are not, indigenous peoples are not discriminated but against, but they are not a majority as, uh, as in other countries, though black people are. So in the early 80s, mid 80s, uh, all the region starts a process of democratization. Most countries of the region uh, start a process of redemocratization after years of military dictatorships. And during this process, the human rights is recognized in constitutions, in international treaties, um, and lately in uh, rulings from by by courts. And women's rights are recognized as well. So, laws establishing quotas for quote for female candidates, legislation on violence on domestic violence, sex same sex marriage being recognized even by court rulings. Most recently, even abortion, which is a taboo theme in the, in the region, was uh, decriminalized in Uruguay up to, to the 12th week of, of uh, pregnancy. At the, inter, at the regional level, a convention on, on violence against women was adopted. So a lot of legislation was adopted. Not that much was implemented. Although it must be said throughout these 30 years, um, 40 years, there has been a lot of progress and in, in this inequality has uh, diminished a bit, significantly, I'd say. But there was a huge gap between legislation and enforcement and what the reality of people really was. And at the moment, in many of the countries, we see a backlash uh, with uh, ultra-right groups taking the power and uh, trying to uh, trying to 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 change even this legislation and policies that were that were already in place. Well. One of the examples that uh, that show how gender can be related to topics that don't have that are much broader and do not necessarily had to do with gender issues was uh, the referendum about the peace agreement in Colombia, one of the few countries in the region where there was a war in the classic definition of war. So the peace agreement in Colombia in, in 2016, uh, it was finally reached between the state and the FARC, this guerrilla group that controlled part of the territory. And it was rejected in a referendum by, the, by, by popular vote. Now you may be thinking what gender has to do with that. And it had to do. A large part of the campaign was around gender issues because of clauses that were included in the peace agreement, but there, there the, none of them really, uh, they, they simply reflected the average, what was already in the laws and practices of Colombia. There was nothing about difficult topics, controversial topics such abortion, for example. But it was used through, um, by deturpating the, the, the content of gender and using a term that was coined as gender ideology, uh, saying that these clauses that don't say not anything re irrelevant, they are behind a whole ideology that wants to um, to impose values that are not Christian, etc. And this type of argument has taken uh, they, they 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 might seem very odd and uh, do not make sense, but they have been used very commonly lately in all sorts of processes. Uh, 
And so this discussion and this term, gender ideology, came was back in this into the spotlight at, in a very strong way in Brazil, and years later in the presidential elections. So uh, and always through a detrimental of content, through fake news, and by using the big data of social networks to identify psychological profiles and direct messages to these profiles that exacerbate these fears, polarize society, increase intolerance, and then they are used to attach moral values to ideological positions in other realms, such as in Colombia, that was the peace agreement, and in Brazil was a political, economic, social uh, stance uh, be behind one candidate, which was the winner. And uh, so what, what I'm saying is that it's important to understand that gender can also be appropriated in a, in, a, in a different way and that we need to be ready to, to counter that. But in order to counter that, you needed to have a very strong civil society that, was, that actually helped accomplish all that legislation and policies that were set in place earlier which was not the case, the civil society is weakened because of a lack of funds uh, in mainly. I had 10 minutes and I <laughs> am going to finish here, despite the fact that I actually did not finish all of the content that I, I, I intended, but I think we we can if have time a for a discussion. If you need to wrap it up, please go ahead. If you want a couple more minutes. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, building on the points that uh, Dana made, I just wanted to, to give you one example of how this um, recogni recognition of different perspectives, which has been often called, uh, used, uh, there, there's a term that has been re recently more used, which is intersectionality, which is very useful for, for, for that in particular. And I think what uh, happened in Latin America in, in the in recent years is that after redemocratization, recognition of rights, economic development, you had the and, and the rise of the internet, of course, and generations being uh, raised in a world in which they recognize them, their, that they individuals have a voice and that they can, can connect worldwide uh, with people who think li uh, like them. I think this is a, this was the context that helped bring the voices of people who have been traditionally marginalized to the center of attention. So you see the Black Lives Matter in the States. Uh, in parallel to that, something similar was happening in Brazil. It's been happening for decades with the work of of social of feminist Black feminist organizations that have challenged the Black movement on one side and challenged the feminist movement on, on the other side. And just to give an example, I once asked, uh, I recently, I was re recently interviewing some people for um, a project on sexual and reproductive rights. And I asked this woman from the Brazilian Black movement, and she started talking about the high rates of mortality of young Black men in the in the outskirts of the, of the cities, of the big cities in Brazil. The numbers are horrific. They are higher than most war, than many wars. And they, tar they mainly target black, black people. So although young black men are the, about this situation, and that's the same thing uh, that you're going to hear from indigenous women in the Amazon with the destruction of the forest, with the land, with the land disputes and so on, and a risk for their own ethnicity to survive. And whereas in the past, this voice could only be brought up by external people who had a voice in the mainstream media and internationally, today, these voices are able to raise on their own behalf. And not only they can have their platforms on the internet, social networks and so on, but they are also launching themselves to the public, to public positions. 
and creating creative ways. For example, right now, uh, this year we have local elections and some people are coming together, like some community leaders. They bring together six community leaders. None of them had the capacity to be elected, just one of them. But the six of them present one candidacy. So one of them is the formal candidate, but they have the commitment to make all decisions together. And by doing so, this has already been tested in the previous election very successfully. And now there are many of them uh, being launched like that. And a lot of them uh, representing people from, uh, from the per periphery of the, of the cities. So I think this is something new, but it has not. So this trendy feminism, this trendy of uh, stronger identities have not gotten to the level of power, of political power. And by not doing so, you, cannot, you don't manage to have to counterbalance the rise of very extremely conservative forces in, in many countries. Yeah. I think I have already passed enough time. No, oh, I must thank say we you. Have <laughs> thank you so much, Denise. No, thank you very much for all these very vivid um, examples. And um, before we, we close our stream, I would love to ask both of you a question. So as you know, we're part of a, a cross-cultural program that engages its fellows that are across the globe working on a variety of different causes that they're interested in. But what they all have in common is that they are whether from an academic point of view or um, an organizational point of view, they're professionally engaged into, into their work. And so when we talk about knowledge to act and inequalities, you both mentioned, let's say, two aspects that could apply to gender, but on a broader conceptual aspect could apply to virtually most change-making topics. And it's challenging power relations on the one hand, and it's this intersectionality that you mentioned, Denise, on the other hand. And so my question to you is, I would like to say simple, but definitely not simple, and I apologize in advance for that, but it's these two aspects are always very central. And we've seen movements across the globe, whether Black Lives Matter is the latest one taking up the media, but there are tons of them, Gilets Jaunes in France or whatever, that work at challenging power relations. But here I'm more interested in looking at the professional, let's say the programmatic, the academic, the educational, the cross-cultural relations, et cetera. So in your experiences, in your research, what have you seen were successful strategies? If you have maybe some examples you could share with us where intersectional strategies could in a way challenge um, these power relations. So uh, I, if one of you would like to, to start, um, otherwise. The, Denise, yeah, please. Um, well, I think I both of us gave examples now, I think the East West in Germany and and uh, this this example of, of black women in Brazil is an example. So they created in Brazil, the, the process was a few black women created their NGOs, they started being active in the black movement, movement and in the feminist movement and challenged them both. And gradually, they managed these two movements to incorporate their agenda as well. So they became much stronger. And they created networks uh, and together and throughout the whole country. I think the uh, identity topics and feminism included, I think there is one strong, the one important uh, feature, which is it talks about everyone's lives. So in order for you to think about the power relations in society, you ideally have thought about the power relations in your life, in your family, in your community, then in your society. And by and this is extremely complex. It's not it's not that obvious how you should behave and what type of relationship you should establish. And by Acknowledging the complexity of, of these problems, that even the, 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 the fact that everyone can have prejudices, 
and every, everyone is potentially can potentially discriminate against uh, others that are not the same. So, or even sometimes the same uh, race, ethnicity, etc., or sex, gender. Um, so, I think the 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 connection between um, a liberation of oneself and a liberation of uh, of, of society is a, a, a very powerful uh, connection, which is difficult to do, but it, it makes sense in today's world uh, in the of the internet, where you connect to the, the you strand individuals, but you also strand the networks, and then it, it can be even more powerful because you are changing cultural patterns, you are changing society, so you are changing the base that and then you're also changing legislation policies and so on without the space you don't the the, the changing in legislation and policies may not reverberate mm -hmm. and or may not be sustainable throughout time this, i'm not sure if i was too abstract and no, you wanted it, something it, more concrete well what i got from this is let's acknowledge our own prejudices and um, and start from here. And I think it's far from being abstract. And of course, there's much more to your, your answer, but I think this is a very concrete um, strategy. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Dana, would you like to share? Yeah, I, I can also share something. And uh, I think, yeah, Denise just uh, developed further the also the triangle relationship that I told at the end it is all I think very important is this starting with your own experiences with your own biographies with your own uh, living uh, through this and I think this perspective is very important also in order to change structural and cultural perceptions to be self-critically and to engage into dialogue and I mean I have maybe more not so classical examples for this intersectionality topic because we are mostly uh, working in this east-west context and there is not so much these discourses do not so much maybe uh, live there or apply there or are not so often applied there but we are as you said i'm working for a women peace organization or for a feminist peace organization and so the question of war and peace is very much in our work and um, the, the biggest project I'm doing at the moment is about um, the Ukrainian um, war in the Donbass, like the situation in the Donbass in Ukraine and the war in Donbass. And I think it is very important to bring people together across conflict lines. This is of course the most like radical way really there is a fi active fighting going on and people meet across the lines and try to find uh, common issues um, but I think this can also apply of course in situation where there is no, no fighting but still there are conflict lines and this question of starting with myself and challenging what the society says this is your enemy although this person might have more common interests with you than your neighbor or your president, uh, then it is. this is very much for me also the question of intersectionality or crossing, like crossing the sections and crossing these borders and challenging um, power relations to see what is really the interest of, uh, of the people who are in um, similar living conditions that I have and how can I find a unity uh, among us. Thank you so much, Dana. This resonates with the relatable, um, finding the unity amongst ourselves to, to join forces. Um, well, thank you very much to, to both of you. Please don't go anywhere. I'd like to thank um, INSI. We hope you enjoyed uh, the session. And we will now be closing the streaming. So thank you very much, INSI.